Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valero Liu for the Remote Chess Academy and today I'm going to bring you some of the most exciting moments and interesting games that were played in the first rounds of the Cinque Field Cup St. Louis Top Grandmaster Tournament. It's taking place in St. Louis but what's most interesting is that we have some of the best chess players like uh, um, Fabiano Carana, like Hikaru Nakamura, Piotr Svidler, Vichy Anand, Aronian, um, the second highest rated player after Carlson Vashier Lagrave. We have had the, the young Anish Giri, Levon Aronian, Wesley So, all the bright and extremely powerful grandmasters that are actually fighting in that tournament. And we see some incredible games, as a matter of fact. That is true. It is absolutely true. So, um, What's most interesting is that we have three of the best American players. We have Nakamura, Karana, and Wesley So. Who do you think is the best? Well, that tournament is definitely going to show up, but you can comment below and give your thoughts on who is the better. We have Wesley So, an incredibly prepared and tactical player. Then we have Karana, who is extremely talented and he's a very imaginative player. And then again, we have Nakamura, who is just exciting to watch. It's just, he's so original as a player. I personally don't have a favorite, but you can give me your thoughts as to why you think any of those three is better than the others. So right now we're going to talk about a couple games. So there we go. We'd like to start with a game that was played between v v Veselin Topolov and Piotr Svidler. It was played in round one. And Topolov actually got a great chance in that game. So he started with e4. The game actually started with the real pass. There was a castling, rookie one. Bishop came back. White challenged black spawn structure with the a4, which pretty much gave him a good control. Then there was the a5 move, which I personally love, as it actually took away the possibility from black to play a5 on his own. And then after bishop e6 in the exchange, white got into a fairly decent position out of the opening. The more interesting part of that game was when white started expanding his position, gaining more space and room for action. He did c3, and as black played bishop to d6, there was a great move that helped each of the white pieces to come forward and really open up while black is still behind. So Topolov did d4. This move was particularly important because it gives white an ability to use and actually fight with his own pieces the rather shaken up and vulnerable pawn structure that black has in his position. Of course black tried to exchange simplifying the game but with that he only made it more weak as there are too many pawn islands that happen. I think his mistake was that he overextended the position with some moves like b4, bishop e6 and so on and even though a lot of people will argue that this is fine, trouble is it's just problematic. I think Black got himself into a very problematic position and pawn structure or the so-called pawn skeleton is re in reality the only thing that matters in the opening. If you get a bad pawn structure, if you get pawn weaknesses or more passive pawn structure, that will likely result in a bad piece skeleton. So that's something that happened right now. Bishop b4 wasn't as precise but he was looking for something more as active in terms of counterplay. Queen d5 Bishop takes to the b4, and then uh, ultimately more and more exchanges happen, more difficult Black's position turns out to be. He's got a lot of pieces that are defending and being backward, so he made h6 in order to open a little flight square and take away g5, but it doesn't really matter because the structural weaknesses help White a lot. Queen a3 was a very precise move by Topolov, pretty much going after the only active piece inside Black's position, the only active piece which is the Queen. He moved it back, but this was the time where White played h3, uh, opening up a little flight square and sort of leaving Black to open himself, which he did with the move of Rook to b4. Was this a good move or a bad move? What do you think about it? I mean, ultimately, White waited for that so he was supposed to be a trap or perhaps he just mis misevaluated that and he thought that black will do rook b2 what do you think take a look at this position what do you think white's got to do about rook b4 well truth is after rook to b4 essentially white played the move of queen c3 and now you see the real problem 
the, the rooks hanging together with the nine. There's pretty much no way to defend them both. And now you see how to act when you have a winning position. Let your opponent force it. Because when he does, he creates weaknesses and then you can take advantage. After knight e2, uh, ultimately white played king h1 and black resigned. But he resigned just because if he took the rook on c1 after the check, queen v1, that was a very smart way on how he would have lost the knight. Even after king f7 and queen takes to the c7, he still loses it. What I really like about this game is the idea of opening of the position while black was still undeveloped and how white exploited the power of his pawn structure to claim his advantage and everything followed. That was a really good game. Let's have a look at another one. Anand Caruana. This was an exciting match between uh, the young Caruana uh, and Vish Anand, who seems to be in a great shape in that tournament. So, <clears throat> uh, it was a really feisty game. Anand started with a very natural development. He did Edicts to the D, which a lot of people would consider um, like not really that dangerous. It opens up the Black Light Square Bishop, but on the other hand, it gives White an easy development without him having to worry about black, it's Black's attack in the center. C5 now will be met by Dedix of the scene on most occasions, and Black will have d5 weak, and so White castled, and he played bishop g5. Setting up the development like this provides him with more control around the center, good challenges on the king side, and way too many good squares where he can develop his pieces. So, even if, if, even if doesn't bring any immediate advantage, the qualities that White is able to get by setting up his rook, the bishop, and challenging black down should give him for a decent middle game fight. The bishop f2, bishop g3 maneuver perhaps wasn't the most precise, but actually this position isn't very dynamic, very tactical, so White definitely has the time. This exchange was very tricky because while white gave away the bishop pair that could potentially turn into an advantage for black, he of course occupied a strong outpost for his bishop and he doubled black's pawns. That doesn't mean there will be an immediate advantage, but it creates an imbalance and oftentimes in order to win you need to make an imbalance in the position to try and put it to your advantage. It was a nice game and ultimately after the move of f4, bishop e7, h3, white took it slowly in order to gradually take his pieces up and bring them on better places. Knight d3, knight e2. I don't, I'm not liking the move of knight e2 because in the end it just gave away the e4 square and it was backward. But again, there's nothing so big that black could achieve. So white kept maneuvering his pieces in order to set them up on the better positions. b4, knight c5, exchange, and knight of g1 in order to bring it towards f3 were just a few of the excellent moves that white took in order to make his position better. Exchange plus knight x h4. It's interesting because now white's getting a pawn up, but as it often happens, when you sacrifice so much of your activity, like the bishop on e5 and the others, just so that you can get a nice activity, it doesn't work too well. Black got a perfect control, and it's hard to prove that the h pawn is actually going to turn into any advantage right now. In fact, black was the one who countered with g5, and so after the exchange and the retake, things looked Excellent. What turns out is that white played queen f2, hoping to take the f6 and just get the opportunity to capture. But uh, what do you think black's got to do right now? I mean, white's a pawn up, and I have to say, if black doesn't find a precise way, white will either invade in the black position or exchange the queens, which will help him to get a clear advantage. What do you think black's got to do? Well, he made something incredible. The queen g3 is powerful, but the more interesting part is queen takes g2, which a lot of people just didn't, didn't see, I bet. Yet, it is a fantastic sequence, which after the exchange leads to rook f2, and there is basically no way on how white can avoid the, the drawing combination. There is rook g2, rook f2, maybe, you know, of course not the exchange, but rook g2 going back, and then there's a draw. It was an exciting game, and I honestly feel like black did do his best to handle the position and the imbalance that white tried to prove he played a little more passively which black very well countered with his activity like the b6 the way to open up the position and activate his own pieces so those weaknesses were never really a problem to black even after he lost a pawn he still kept a certain edge so let's take a look at the neck in the game between Karana and topolov we see some pretty exciting battle raging 
He started with e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6. Kerouan was playing with the white pieces, and he played the ruler pass, d3. A lot of people consider this passive, but the truth is it's very interesting, and it could squeeze black down. While white doesn't have to worry about his center no more, he gets this very effective way of setting up the pieces and preparing them effectively. The a4 challenges b5, and it actually helps white to get this flexible development. Now the knight is going down to c2 to e3. Essentially at some point the black bishop will exchange and white is going to get this beautiful d5 square as a possibility for his knight. So the knight came back, bishop h4 happened and it went down to b4. White moved rook e1 and d4. As you can see, black is getting just a standard development with the idea to advance in queenside, but white gets that strong, flexible preparation he wants to counter in the center. Of course, he doesn't have that much of a perfection between his pieces, which gives black a good shot to, to advance against f3 and e4. But um, yeah, I guess white should have played h3 as a more preferable move here. Bishop to b1 felt a little bit inactive, a little bit more passive, and a couple of the next moves just felt like going back and forth that gave black an opportunity. It's, uh, it was a pretty strong opportunity, and we can actually talk about that. I think that white's idea to just wait a little bit while black decides on what he will do just didn't fit. So what do you think Black's got to do now? I mean, if you see somebody who's waiting like that, going back and forth for his pieces, you just can't let him do that. You have to figure out some forcing, immediate possibility to try and prove, uh, and prove some advantage. Well, what do you think Black's got to do? That was the move. Here we go. Knight is the e4. It shoots directly, even though this move looks like a lo loss for black. It looks like a losing move as white can just take the bishop and then hit the knight. But then you realize that after bishop takes the e7, black has the in-between knight e to d2, taking advantage of the actual pin on f3 and using the queen and the knight to simply destroy white's king's protection. Seeing that, of course, white found out that bishop takes f3 and knight takes f3 in case of bishop going somewhere is going to be more than just a dangerous combination. It's going to be a real kill. And so he didn't really like to do this. He didn't really like the fact that black's pieces are just going to come so far and so much. So he played with bishop takes f3, b3, and even though that seems to help, you realize that black's queen and bishop being coordinated are much more powerful as opposed to all white pieces that seem all over the place. Like queen d2 is met by a queen d7, and no matter the defenses, black is able to checkmate. Seeing that, Karana quickly hurried to give away the material and hopefully bring three pieces versus a queen. And I think that this, this was his best practical chance. Three pieces are known better to be better than a queen. However, in this particular case, they're just not well connected. Black has some ideas like rook a1 and queen h3, which would really pin white's pieces down on passive squares. So white decided to sack the pawn in order to consolidate very easily. I think rook a1 would have been more helpful, or even the better, in my opinion, best move of rook e8. This actual move was great because, uh, in fact... I don't believe that white is able to even protect his pieces too well. The queen is going to come down to e1 or e4, and it really feels like a struggle for white to manage his pieces in a good way. There will be a lot of tactical ideas and a lot of different things that black could use with his queen versus white's uncoordinated pieces. Taking the pawn on d4 just felt a bit of a rushed move that even though it didn't hurt, it felt... Like, it wasn't the best. Queen takes to the d1, bishop takes d, and king g2. Gave black a rook and two pawns versus two minor pieces, but since the pawns aren't that far advanced and mostly blockaded, white can definitely go for the draw. He made some good sequence with the pawn, the bishop, and the knight together, and of course with the king supporting and blockading, black saw that there was no real breakthrough. Even if he plays g4, that pawn kind of can hardly get promoted, as the rook cannot help it, because of the defense on b5. So it was the most most exciting game with a lot of with a lot of turns like going back and forth, yet you realize why time is important in these dynamic and tactical positions. White slowed down even for a couple of moves and then black found a brilliant way to counter it with the excellent pieces he, he built together. In this next game we uh, witness an incredible battle between the youth and uh, you know, the wisdom, the old wisdom. Vasher Lagrave versus Vichy Anand. 
And this game was truly brilliant. I gotta tell you, that was one of the best games, and it's mostly instructive, so let's have a look and see what happened. Vashir Lagrave played the Karakam. He approached, he approached it in, a, in this more of a rare way, playing knight f3, knight c3, instead of going with d4. So he probably wanted to avoid any major theory. So he played knight e2, but as you can see, all of this requires so many unnatural moves, going backward and trying to push the pawn a little too further. Even though, in order, in order to uh, like advance against the black knight, white had to play knight after the g1. So all these moves just feel really bad and unnatural. And Anand, with his experience and the hyena type of feeling, he knew that he's got to punish it, and he did brilliantly. He played f6 to counter white's strongest pawn on e5. Then he did the move of knight of the g5. Of course, exchange happened, and f4. White's still hoping that he can get this very good structure, but he realizes he can't quite do it with the black knight on e4 and c5 coming, so he makes another attempt to fight it, probably exchange it, and then d c3. Um, queen h5, king v8, and bishop c4. It almost feels like White is doing perfectly well, but he doesn't. The, the problem with delaying development is that it has long-term effects on your, develop, on your position. Even if the opponent doesn't get to punish you right away, lo sooner or later things are going to go bad. And that's sort of what happened. Black played c5 in order to counter white. He did rook to the d8. He played f5 to get everything together. And after a few of the next moves, you can actually see that despite all of the endeavors for the white queen to come forward and attack, black is just able to solidify and just get everything together. It was really hard to see what white is going to do. And that's why I say that the opening development is so important. No, you can't crush the opponent in the, in the opening, but don't think about it. Think about how you can get the relevant, easy, good preparation that will help you in the longer run. White didn't get that, and that really affected all. Black simply qu and quietly managed his own development perfect, and then after queen h6, rook d1, and rook f8, you could see that it's hard to expect white is going to get too much. Now, move 30 was really interesting because white had a couple options. In fact, uh, Lagrave played bishop takes d6, knight takes d6. He thought that the, once the pawn falls, the d5 knight is going to get down, and the question really is, is this right? Was that calculation correct? Um, I think the move looks really winning. And a lot of people will be like, oh, yeah, definitely. I'd love to do that. But you have to understand, when you look at a position in a move like that, make sure that you look at it from a different angle also. It's just that critical move like that may have its own drawbacks as well. And if you look at it only from the perspective of, okay, how can I win with this? What is it going to give me? You're going to miss to think about this from your opponent's perspective in terms of what are your weaknesses? What will be the vulnerabilities that this change, the sequence is going to make to your position? The real deal is that after knight takes to the e6 and then bishop takes the e6, White played bishop takes d5, but then black found the brilliant e3 in between move that actually loses for white as he can't move the bishop on g3 due to e2, nor he can take on e3, which he did uh, because of bishop takes d5, and now we see that e3 is hanging. In fact, all that white had to do was likely to exchange the knight and probably he'd have an equal position after queen h3 or bishop e3. Still a little more passive, but that's what happens when you do these things on the opening. Knight takes d6, however, was a little too over-optimistic, and White was just looking at it in only, only one way, which led him to lose a piece. Even if White didn't play with bishop takes d7, but tried to counter after bishop e4, we realized that the take on a7 wouldn't really change anything. Black's upcoming rook g8 and challenges on g2 would have been a killer, so I guess he just tried to take queen f2, queen takes to the c5, and so on. But now being a piece down is certainly not something White can just ignore. Step by step, Anand managed to take away the important pawn, started the passer, and White had to resign. It's an incredibly interesting game to see about these original different type of approaches and how carefully you have to look at a critical breakthrough and think about it in a different angle. Overall, in conclusion, i like to say that this is one of the most interesting tournaments and one of the best tournaments taking place this year and taking in place in US. So you can actually observe it from all over the place or even access 
all the complete game analysis from the Re Remo Chess Academy website. Uh, they've changed their strategy a little bit, so from now on, they'll be providing some commentary for the biggest chess tournament, and it is very important for us to know if you like this new strategy or not. For this reason, please comment below the video, or like it if you really liked it, share it with your friends, or bring up any sort of constructive feedback or suggestions on anything you want to share. Thank you so much. This is International Master Valerio for the Remote Chess Academy, and I'll see you next time.